everyone hear me now? Okay, good. So that's the title of our talk here, as uh, was just mentioned, Dom Features You Didn't Know Existed. So before I get into the material, um, you might want to take notes or something, or maybe uh, type some stuff into your laptop, but uh, you don't really have to, because at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a URL, uh, which will take you to a page with the slide deck and all of the links and resources that I'm mentioning in this presentation. So if you want, you can take some notes, but you'll get everything all in one shot uh, at the end. So before we get into the, the gist of my uh, discussion here, let's look at why I, I think it's important to discuss this topic. So why do developers love jQuery? We all know it's probably the most popular JavaScript library in the world. And I would say there's two reasons why. First of all, jQuery is cross-browser. It solves a lot of the problems uh, that exist in browsers as far as bugs and inconsistencies. And second of all, and probably the more important thing is it's very easy to use. Uh, jQuery provides a very simple API on top of what JavaScript already provides, uh, and it's very easy to get right into using it. Uh, so I think that's the main two reasons that uh, jQuery has been so popular. But the DOM has not been very popular uh, for a number of years. And about uh, seven years ago, John Resig, the creator of J jQuery, gave this presentation entitled The Dom is a Mess, where he talked about uh, what problems exist in the Dom when it comes to browsers. And he made this statement. He said, nearly every single Dom method has a bug in it somewhere in some browser. So that was back in 2009. So where do we stand today? Well, I'm not going to go on a limb and say the DOM is cross-browser, because that is absolutely not true. But we're in much better shape today than we were in uh, back in 2009 when John said those words, and basically when jQuery really started to take off. And uh, in addition to the fact that browser support is so much better when it comes to DOM scripting, uh, it's also very easy to use. It's always been easy to use when you put aside the uh, inconsistencies and browser bugs and so forth. So uh, when we're talking about the DOM, um, I don't know how, how many of you here are kind of new to JavaScript and the DOM. Do we have a lot of front-end developers here? Maybe a raise of hands. Okay, good. So it seems to be a lot and maybe a few uh, that are just starting out. So uh, just to make a, a differentiation here between what do we mean by the DOM in relation to JavaScript. So we should understand that these are essentially two separate technologies. Um, JavaScript, of course, is based on the ECMAScript specification. And this is a screenshot of the newest uh, uh, website that they put up for the ECMAScript specification. It makes it much easier to find things. Uh, and JavaScript is essentially concerned with uh, stuff that you see here in this, uh, this code block that I have here. Uh, the for loops, the if, if statements, the switch statements, maybe things like function syntax, and so on. So the core of the language, JavaScript, that's what ECMAScript uh, that's what JavaScript is based on, the ECMAScript specification, which defines standards uh, based on those types of things. So if you look up a JavaScript feature on a popular web reference, like, for example, platform dot, uh, webplatform.org, uh, shown in the screenshot here, uh, you'll notice that those sp specific features fall under this category here. You see there, it's under JavaScript, and then in that case, it's under the category of statements. And if you look at what specifications those are under, again, it'll show you that, in fact, uh, those features are based on ECMAScript. So in this case, it's indicating ECMAScript 2015 6th edition. But on the other hand, if you look up a DOM feature, here's one that's very well known, get element by ID, uh, it's under the category of DOM. Technically speaking, the DOM is not JavaScript, but because uh, the DOM, has, because JavaScript is basically the only real client-side language that browsers understand and that has become kind of universal, um, the DOM and JavaScript kind of works together. Like you, you can't write DOM script, DOM methods and properties without JavaScript unless you're using some other uh, client-side language like VBScript or something like that, which was used way back maybe in the late 90s. So if you look up a DOM feature, 
uh, on maybe Mozilla Developer Network or webplatform.org, it will indicate that it's under the DOM living standard rather than the ECMAScript specification as was shown earlier. So that just kind of shows you just a base, the basic difference. So those of you who are maybe a little new to DOM scripting and JavaScript, that's, uh, there's kind of a deline delineation there between those two technologies, but essentially uh, they're intertwined in the same uh, process. We use DOM scripting in the middle of our JavaScript or in the midst of our scripting with JavaScript. Um, some very common DOM features that uh, many of us have probably used, if I, we've been coding JavaScript, stuff like get element by ID, get elements by tag name, uh, add event listener, create element, attribute, get attribute, set attribute. And then there are stuff related to child and parent relationships. Uh, child node, first child, parent node, next sibling, previous sibling, append child. So those of us who have been writing JavaScript for a while, no doubt we've probably used many of these. Then there are these methods that are and properties that are kind of related to CSS, where you can get elements by class name. The second one there is the style object, which gives you CSS information uh, that, you, that are found in line on elements. Um, class name, class list, and uh, two that I've been using a lot in my code lately, query selector and query selector all. So if you're pretty new to JavaScript uh, and DOM scripting, um, those last three slides that I just showed, you can kind of give you a starting point for what kind of things you want to look into and, and kind of know uh, quite well. Uh, and those of us who've been scripting, who've been writing JavaScript for a while, um, we probably used maybe all of those, if not most of them. So now what about lesser known DOM stuff? So that's what this particular uh, presentation is all about. So let's take a look at uh, some stuff that maybe even those of you who've been coding JavaScript for a while didn't know existed. And it might be partly because we're accustomed to using libraries like jQuery and partly because uh, the DOM has always been associated with uh, bad browser support. So here's a simple one uh, called insert adjacent HTML. So what does this do? This will insert a string of HTML uh, at a specified point. It's a, Pretty simple the way it works. So let's say you have uh, HTML that looks like this. We have a one element and a two element, and we want to put some, maybe some dynamically generated HTML right in between those two elements. Uh, insert adjacent, there are other ways to do this, but insert adjacent HTML uh, makes it very simple. So first we grab a reference to our two element, that's the one we're going to use for, in this case, there on line two. And then we use the insert adjacent HTML method, passing in uh, two arguments. The first one is, as you can see there, a string that's called a before begin. And then we pass in uh, a string of HTML. So it's important that you understand it's a string, and it needs to go in quotations, just like the first argument. Uh, and it's that simple. So after running that code, our, the generated HTML will look like that. It's put it right into our page exactly where we wanted. Um, white space aside, it'll actually, it won't preserve the white space like you see there on lines five and seven. Uh, it'll kind of jam everything together, but that's the basic principle, that it places it in between those two elements. So it did it because in that, this is the previous slide again, uh, because I used the before begin argument. So the, before, the first argument can be any one of these four values, before begin, after begin, before end, and after end. And this, is, this HTML snippet is kind of a visual representation of where exactly those uh, values will place the HTML. So as long as we're dealing with the two element, we're calling the method on the two element, this is where the, el the element that we, or the string of HTML that we insert will be placed. So either before the element begins, after it begins, which is kind of like uh, where CSS pseudo elements are placed, before it ends, and after it ends. And there are also the two related elements, uh, insert adjacent, uh, or two related methods, insert adjacent element and insert adjacent text. Uh, with insert adjacent element, you can actually create an, uh, an HTML element on the fly and then insert that as an element rather than as a string of HTML. And then with adjacent text, you would insert a string of text. So even if you did put HTML in there, uh, it would render it right on the page, um, escaped, like as if it was, you could see the angle brackets, in other words. 
Okay, here's another one called Get Bounding Client Rect. Uh, another one maybe you haven't seen. Uh, so this one returns the size of an element and its position relative to the viewport. So what exactly do we mean by that? So here we're applying it to our element. It doesn't matter what element it is. And then I'm logging out what this method returns. And you can see there in that JavaScript comment exactly what's logged out. And so all it is is a set of properties that have specific values telling us where exactly the element is located on the page and how high and how wide it is. Uh, and you can see how specific it is. So if you need really precise measurements of elements, uh, maybe it's maybe in a game context, a JavaScript game, or something dynamic where the user is interacting, uh, dragging elements around the screen, you can actually find out exactly where that element is located and exactly how big it is. And you access the properties uh, just like you see there, um, using the, just the dot notation, just like that. So again, the top, bottom, left, and right values are uh, relative to the viewport, and that would include scrolling position. So if you had an element on the page that was like 3,000 pixels down the page, it would actually tell you that it was 3,000 pixels from the top, or whatever amount of pixels it was. And another one that you can look up is get client rect. It's a similar method. Uh, it's actually really interesting. I don't necessarily think it's that useful because it's only for inline elements. But what's interesting about that one is that if the inline element is broken up into multiple lines, it will give you uh, an object that represents all of, the, all of the rectangles in that inline element because it ends up being broken up into multiple rectangles. It's kind of hard to explain. I, I wasn't going to go into detail in the presentation, but it's actually worth looking into. It's a pretty cool uh, method as well. Okay, uh, so here's another one, the data set property, which is essentially a, an API. So this lets you access custom HTML5 data attributes using a simple API. So let's look at an example of some HTML. Um, so here we have our baseball player profile, you could say. I don't know how many here are from Toronto, but... <laughs> um, so these are HTML attributes that we create ourselves. As long as they start with the data hyphen uh, prefix, it can, we can write whatever we want. We, so I've written data name, data type, data team, and then data epic moment. Uh, those of you who are not familiar, this is the epic moment there. Okay. So we can actually access all of those properties and their values via JavaScript, and we can manipulate them as well. So a little more code there, but don't be too intimidated. Um, it's very simple. We just uh, use our element to access those particular values. So what you see in the comment at the end of lines four to seven are the values that we've input in there in the HTML. Um, I'm just basically logging those out, uh, accessing them using the dot notation. And uh, note that on line seven, the epic moment, uh, you notice I didn't use a hyphen. Here I'm using a hyphen uh, in the HTML, but you have to convert that uh, into camel case after, after the data set dot, after that is where you do the camel case, but only if you're using a hyphen. And as you can see on lines nine and 10, not only can you read these properties with JavaScript, but you can also uh, change them. So I'm changing bat flip to bat toss, and then I'm reading that again, and then it in fact does tell me that it's bat toss. Even though the source will still say bat flip, it will, uh, the dynamic generated source will say bat toss. Some people think it was a toss, not a flip. You know. Okay, uh, so let's now look at event target uh, versus event current target. So these two properties let you differentiate between the object that was clicked and the object on which uh, the event was attached. Okay, now that might sound a little confusing, so let's just illustrate it. So say we have the following HTML. We have a parent and then a child element inside the parent. So what if the parent, uh, shown there, has a click event attached to it, but then the child is clicked? Well, we know that the child will, in fact, trigger the parent's uh, click event because the child is technically part of the parent. It's inside the parent. But we want to differentiate between which one of those two was clicked when that um, event is triggered. So we can actually do that with event target and event current target. Uh, event target is the element that was clicked, and event current target is the element on which the original event 
was attached. So it probably, it needs, uh, I need a little bit of a demonstration. I think I have a demo open here. Hopefully the, yeah. So if I click on the, the parent element here, the blue one, uh, we can see that it logged out both the uh, current target and the target. So you can see in both cases it was the parent. But if I click on the child element here, the yellow box, it logs out child and parent because now it's differentiating between the two. So it's a very specific thing. Again, in, a, in the midst of a dynamic application, a complex application with user interaction, uh, that could certainly come in handy to be able to differentiate those two. Uh, let's look at quickly at has attributes. You've probably heard of has attribute, where you pass in an attribute and you want to find out if an element has that exact attribute. But you'll notice in this case, uh, there's an S on the end, has attributes, it's kind of a lesser known one. This lets you check, of, check uh, the existence of any attributes, nothing specific. Uh, so f just s uh, some code here with two paragraph elements, one has an attribute, the other does not. So on lines four to six, we're just using has attribute to check if it has a class attribute. So that's fine, we might do something in relation, uh, in response to that. But then on lines seven and eight, we're using has attributes to check if these two paragraphs have any attributes at all. And then it just logs either true or false. It returns true or false, and then we can deal with things uh, from there. We can see that the first paragraph has attributes, thus it returns true, the second one uh, does not. Okay, so earlier on one of the earlier screens, I mentioned some child and parent relationship type uh, methods and properties. Uh, here are some that are a little lesser known. Child element count, first element child, and last element child. Uh, so what do these allow you to do? So here we'll have a list, just a regular HTML list with uh, five elements in it, and we've added a couple of classes to elements one and five, just so we can uh, see what happens here. So once we grab a reference to that list, we can use child element count to just tell us how many elements are in that list. So in this case, it's just logging out five, as you can see there on line four. And, and then we can also get reference, easy reference to the first element in that list using first element child or the last element using last element child. You can do whatever you want with those. I just happen to be looking at the class name in this case, logging out the name of the, each class, one and five. And so on the surface, if you're kind of new to uh, JavaScript, you might wonder why I already know how many are in that list. But remember, in, in the midst of a dynamic application where things are changing, uh, you can easily have this list change and then very easily find out exactly which is the first element, which is the last element, and which and how many elements there are altogether, just with one line, just like what you see there, each of those three lines. And what's cool about this is that it's instead of first child, it's first element uh, child and last element child, uh, which is different. Because if you do first child, you're actually going to get text nodes, uh, white space nodes as well. So this is really good because it, it doesn't uh, take uh, other nodes into consideration, just elements, which is ultimately most of the time uh, all we want to deal with. Okay, here's the, this, is, this one is probably the most complex of the ones that I'm featuring in this presentation, compare document position. Um, but this one is actually used in the core uh, jQuery library, um, and it, probably because of uh, browser support, because it goes way back to, I believe, IE5. Uh, so this one allows you to know where a DOM node is in relation to another DOM node. So here's some... Just basic HTML, we have a head, a body, and then we have two elements, one nested inside the other, uh, inside of our body. So we want to find out the relationships of these elements to one another. How do we do that? Well, with compare document position. So the key portion of the code there is lines seven and eight, uh, where you're basically saying, I want to compare the one element to the two element, and then it logs out a number, I'll get to that in a moment. In that case, it logs out 20, and then the, in the line eight, the last line there, I want to compare the head to the body. What's the relationship between those? And then it logs out a number as well. So the value is actually a bit mask, which as John Resig explained, uh, is a way of storing multiple points of data within a single number. Uh, and I'm sure some of you who are programmers already knew what a bit mask was. Uh, he, this is a chart on uh, Mozilla Developer Network on the 
article for compare document position that gives you the values and what each of them mean. Now, you'll notice that in our case, we logged out 20 for, numbers, uh, for line 7 there. And yet, 20 is not on the list. So the reason is, uh, as the explanation made clear, that it's multiple points of data in one. So in our case, the 20, again, which you see there on line 7, is represented by, in the chart, values 16 and 4. So again, let's go back to the HTML. We're comparing the 1 to the 2. So the 2 is inside the 1. And yeah, the 2 is inside the 1. And so if we go here, we can see the 16 represents a contained by. So that's why it returns 16. But it also added 4 to that. So it, it also, the 2 element also follows the 1 element, technically speaking, even though it's inside of it. So it also returns 4. So that one's a little bit complex, but it is uh, kind of worth checking out if uh, you're concerned about uh, element relationships uh, in, uh, in maybe a, a dynamic application. Uh, here's another one in a similar vein, node contains. So what does this do? Well, it allows you to check if one element contains another, exactly what the, the method's name implies. So we can do a bunch of different tests with the HTML here. We have a body element. We have a parent, child, and grandchild uh, nested inside of one another. And then we have another box that's separate from those others. So I know that's a lot of code <laughs> to look at there, but it's not complicated at all. The first half of that is just references to the elements. And then I'm just checking, the, checking to see what contains what. That's it. You just, all, each one of those lines returns either true or false. And you can see the first five there return true because I'm checking if one of the child elements uh, is contained by the parents and elements. And then uh, it starts to get false on line 13 because I'm checking if the child uh, contains the parent, which obviously it doesn't, so it returns false. Uh, for some reason, body contains body returns true. Parent contains parent, same thing. I guess it doesn't totally make sense, but just know that that does, in fact... Occur. So a very simple method, um, and the name is very easy to remember as well if you need to check if one element contains another. Uh, here's one called is equal node. So this allows you to find out if two DOM nodes are equal. So here's some more example HTML. We have a bunch of comments. So comments are accessible via JavaScript when we're dealing with nodes specifically. And... And you can see on line 7 through 10, we just have some regular div elements. So we're going to check to see if uh, these elements are, any of these elements are equal to one another. And you can tell just by looking at, for example, the first two comments, those are equal to one another. So that's what we're comparing here in this code. So uh, node 1 and node 3, now the reason why we're skipping numbers here, this is not really the way you would do it. Normally you would loop through the nodes and do it that way. I'm just doing direct reference using the indexes. Um, and the numbers skip because uh, it's, it, remember that nodes also include white space nodes. So when I check elements one and three, or nodes one and three, um, I, I'm doing that because there's white space here in the HTML. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing to see is how the is equal node works. And you can see it either logs true or false. And probably the most interesting one is, I believe, uh, well, first of all, the comments on lines 5 and 6. So I'm comparing those two, and it returns false. That's the line 7. And it returns false, even though they look pretty much the same, because it's missing a space at the end of the comment on line 6. So they're not exactly the same. So these nodes are not considered equal. Um, and then you'll notice line 7 and line 9, at first glance, they look like different elements. They look like they're uh, different. They're not equal. But in fact... Um, the, the log says that they're false. I believe that's line 9 here. And the reason for that is because, uh, is because the, the attributes... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Those are, in fact, uh, the same. So that log, log's true on line 10. Sorry about that. Uh, the reason they're true is because it's the exact same attributes. So the attributes are swapped around, but the, the, the method is equal node doesn't care. As long as the attributes are exactly the same, it will consider those two nodes equal. So again, it might be a little confusing at first glance, but uh, just fiddle around with it, and you'll see that it's a very simple method. Um, 
Here's another interesting one, which allows you to get information from pseudo-elements via JavaScript. Maybe you didn't realize that you could do that. And you can do this using the get computed style method. And many of you may have used this to get style information uh, off specific elements. So here I'm just getting the color and the width of the L element that I've passed in here. But if I want to get the style information of the pseudo elements on the L element, I can do that just like this. So you pass in an optional second argument and you indicate which pseudo element you want inside the quotations and then you can get whatever style information you want, whatever uh, computed styles you want. So whatever styles are defined in the CSS or maybe changed via JavaScript on the fly on the uh, pseudo elements, uh, then you can in fact uh, get those values there. So that's uh, a neat little thing. Actually, I don't think you can access, uh, you, I don't think you can change pseudo element styles with CSS, now that I think of it. Um, unless you, well, with JavaScript, only with CSS, I believe. But you can read them, just like we see there. So this doesn't seem to work with uh, first letter and first line, uh, but uh, you can, uh, but you can use, a, like as mentioned, with the before and after, and you can use the single colon or the double colon syntax. You probably just want to use single colon because that gives you browser support uh, a little further back. Okay, uh, let's look at text content. Uh, the text content property. This one is really useful because it lets you obtain only the text content of an element. So let's say we have a module with a paragraph inside and some text with some random inline HTML kind of interspersed there within the text. So what if we want to grab all of the text but we don't want any of that HTML? Well, we just do it with the text content property. So on line five, we're logging out the text content which we've grabbed there on line three on the module element. And then it returns the exact a string of text that we want. Uh, so you can see the text that's logged out on line seven is exactly what's here minus the HTML. Now the only thing with that is that sometimes the, the white space is a little uh, out of whack with text content. Um, so in general, this works as an alternative to inner HTML. Inner HTML lets you access all of the HTML within a particular element. Um, so it might be useful for user-entered data where we want to strip out all of that HTML that's inside there and just get the text. Um, and as mentioned, this one it has it's kind of wonky when it comes to the the white space. But there's actually a non-standard one called inner text. It's not officially in the specification, but it's supported by all browsers. So some people actually recommend you use that one instead. Firefox is the latest browser to finally come on board with inner text, and it goes all the way back to IE6 as well. And the good thing about inner text is the major difference is that it it is much better with white space. Uh, it will give you, I believe, exactly uh, the HTML equivalent of the white space. So if there's like five spaces, it'll break it down to one space, the same way that uh, you would generally want in HTML. Okay, so on the topic of text, uh, let's look at normalize and split text. And two uh, fairly straightforward methods that uh, are very self-explanatory too, once you get to know them. Uh, so. To, to understand what these do, we need to understand, first of all, every string of text in HTML is counted as a single text node. So that's one node if you have a string of text inside of an element. But if you use something like a pen child to add a text node somewhere, it actually creates a separate text node. So it, here, here I'm doing exactly that. I'm, I'm appending child uh, and then creating a text node. Uh, to the end of what you see in the HTML there. So if I, the, so the problem is that this is counted as two separate text nodes inside the L element. So if I do element child nodes length, it will tell me there's two nodes inside that div, even though at, when you glance at the generated source, it actually looks like one string of text. So normalize actually lets you normalize that text uh, and it returns it to being one string of text. So there could be some instance where you want that to happen because you want to grab all of that text just as one single node. And so we we're checking the length again after applying normalize to the L element, and now we have just one uh, child inside there, one node. 
And split text basically does the opposite. It actually splits a text, a string of text or a node, a text node into multiple text nodes. And we can see how that's done uh, here in this, these two lines of JavaScript. And, uh, and then we can log out the text content of each of those nodes. So it might be a little complicated, but again, uh, the, the references that I'm going to give you at the end of the presentation actually have demos, demos, demo pages for all of these as well on JSBin that you can fiddle around with uh, if any of this was a little bit confusing. Uh, so normalize doesn't take any arguments. Split text takes one argument. It's the offset uh, within the string represented by an integer. So you're basically telling it where you want to split the text into the two nodes. Okay, uh, here's an interesting one that's probably not that useful, but I just thought it was interesting that it actually exists, that you can actually create an HTML comment uh, using a create comment method. Uh, and so it's just three simple lines of HTML, uh, of JavaScript, that will add a comment to our HTML. Um, I don't know why you'd want to do this, but, uh, you know, crazier things have been found to be useful, I guess. Um, so I'm creating the comment on line two, um, I'm logging out the text, just the text content of it, just to prove that in fact I have created it, and then I just append it to the body using a pen child. And then uh, our HTML will then look like this, assuming there was nothing else in there. It'll actually have a comment in there that was produced on the fly. So again, I have no idea why you'd want to do that, but it's there, it's in the specification. And it's very easy to use, two lines, that's all it took. Um, we're all, I'm sure, familiar with HTML tables. Uh, maybe we didn't know that there's actually a table API with very specific methods that let you easily uh, generate tables on the fly. Uh, there's ways to do this in HTML uh, or in JavaScript just by kind of generating strings and whatnot and inserting them. But uh, this one makes it very easy. Uh, here we have a basic HTML structure with our table and our t-body element. And starting from that point, uh, we'll run some code that looks like this. You don't have to understand all of that. Uh, we're, at the top, we're just doing a loop, we're looping 10, 10 times. That's, we're going to create 10 rows. And there on line four, we're using insert row, which is part of the table API, to insert a row. And inside each of those rows, we're inserting uh, three cells using the insert cell method. So these are not functions or methods that I've created personally, these are in the specification. You can actually do them this way. And we're accessing each of the rows using uh, the rows property, as we can see there, which again is part of that API. So then uh, we also have the create caption. So we know HTML tables um, often have a caption at the beginning. We can create that and append it to uh, the DOM uh, in that way. And then our HTML will basically look like this. Uh, with the eight, the other eight rows uh, removed for brevity, but that's basically the gist of it. You can generate an HTML table using some very simple uh, DOM scripting. Let's look at uh, something called active element. So what does this one do? Uh, the MDN defines it as it returns the currently focused element, which is the element that will get keystroke events if the user types any. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why it describes it as keystroke events if, it, if the user types any, but basically it just tells you which element is the active element uh, kind of waiting to receive some kind of uh, interaction, whether it be keyboard or otherwise. So uh, let's say we have the following HTML, and in fact, uh, I'll use, I think I have a demo set up for this one as well. Um, yeah, here it is. Might not be able to see all of it. Yeah, so if I click uh, into the name field, you can see uh, down here, I'll just highlight that, uh, it's giving me which element is the current active element. So wherever I click, you can see if I click off to nothing, uh, it tells me the body is the active element. Here it tells me the email is the active element. Here the question text area, the submit button, and then we can also do it on these elements here, which are not form elements, the box and box two. I think everyone can see that, right? Yeah, so this is the code that I was using for that. It's very simple. Uh, I'm, I'm on line four, I'm just reading uh, a data attribute that I said that we talked about earlier. 
Uh, and line three is where I get the active element. That's how you use it. You just do document active element, and then on click, I'm finding out which one of those elements was in fact clicked. So again, there's just a visual representation there. Um, and so all browsers seem to allow any element to be the active element, not just uh, the ones that can receive input. Uh, and as the third bullet point points out there, non-form non elements, uh, like in this case, the two boxes down here, uh, these two boxes require uh, that you put the tab index attribute. So that kind of makes them a part of that, uh, that process of being able to read the active element or read them as an active element. And as we saw, if no specific element is clicked, then the body element is the active element. But for whatever reason, body doesn't require tab index. That's, I think that's the only element that doesn't require tab index. Okay, uh, let's look at selection start and selection end. Uh, so these methods work on form inputs. So they let us retrieve the start and end points of user-selected text uh, in a form input. So on line three, that's where I'm using selection start and selection end. So I'm passing those in as arguments for the, to the substring method, which is a, a JavaScript method. And, and then I'm listening for the select event on line eight. And then I'm logging out uh, what, what is selected. So I think I also have a demo for this. So in this case, uh, I'll, let's see. Oh no, that's not selection, let's see. Uh, no, I don't think I have the demo set up for that, okay. well. Uh, this is basically how it works. I'll just show you the visual here. So let's say we have uh, an input element uh, with uh, that's our name or whatever. The selected text is, uh, and, and we display it on the page just like that. So the user selects uh, part of it, and then it tells you exactly uh, what has been selected, giving you a start, start point and an end point. Okay, and so this is the one that was actually in the demo. So set selection range, still on the topic of selecting text. This one lets you dynamically select uh, a range of text. And so we're doing it with a button, and I think that's the one that I have here. Yeah, set selection range. So if I click on this button here, select text, it will select the word example. And it's a little hard to see there because of the, uh, the colors, but... It's, that's the word example because that's what I've defined here uh, in the JavaScript. Uh, and same thing going on in the slide here. Um, this is the JavaScript uh, that I'm using. Line 7 is the one you want to look at for set selection range. You simply just pass uh, two arguments, and in this case, selecting uh, the text that you see there in that particular slide demonstration. Uh, so again, two arguments, start and end selection within the given text. For some reason, Firefox needs the focus method for this to work. That's why here on line six, uh, I've included that. So if you're using that, you'll need to include that. And it also takes an optional, di optional direction argument, but I couldn't get that to work. I'm not really sure. It's supposed to uh, reverse the direction of a selection, I believe. But for some reason, I couldn't get that to work. I'm not sure if I was doing something wrong. Okay, here's one called get selection. This one, you can find out what portion of text has been selected by the user. So instead of selecting it uh, dynamically yourself uh, as a developer, in this case, you're going to find out what they've selected. So uh, here on line five is where the method is used. We're simply calling window get selection on mouse up. So here's some text that's selected by the user, and then I've displayed that text on the page in this case. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, you can even do something behind the scenes the user won't even know. Maybe you want to find out what their habits are and when selecting things in a specific context. Uh, so the selection returned <coughs> is not a string. It's a selection object that has its own methods and properties. So, it, But in order to, to do... Uh, string manipulation using customary JavaScript uh, methods and such, uh, we, you have to actually uh, convert it first to a string because it's an object that's not a string. So, okay, here's another one called element from point. So this takes two arguments, the horizontal and vertical positions uh, within the viewport. The viewport. 
uh, and it will return the topmost or the closest element to the given coordinates. So in this case, uh, line three, I'm just passing in uh, two coordinates, 50-50, and, and then I'm just getting the text content of the element uh, that, that is the closest element from that point. So it's, just, it's very simple. It just gives you the element that's closest to the coordinates that you specify. So again, it could really come in handy uh, in a context of some things changing, things moving around, and you don't know uh, how things have uh, been altered on the page uh, until you run that method or that property. Uh, and then on line six, I'm just, again, just checking uh, some style information on that particular element. You could do whatever you want with the element that you access uh, that's given to you via element from point. Uh, here's a method uh, called scroll by. Uh, this simply lets you scroll horizontally or vertically, vertically by the specified amount. So you can just uh, scroll the page uh, using JavaScript. Uh, it takes two arguments, the value to scroll horizontally and the value to scroll vertically. So in most cases, you're not doing horizontal scrolling on web pages. You're doing uh, vertical scrolling. Uh, so I'm passing in zero as the horizontal uh, position, and then I am passing in, in this case, window inner height, which gives me the exact height of the window, so that way I can actually uh, scroll down by a full page at a time. Uh, and you can use, also use negative values, which will allow you to scroll either left in the horizontal direction or up vertically. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, a similar one is scroll into view. So this simply scrolls a targeted element into view. Um, it just you just call it on whatever element you want. Here, line two, I reference the element I want, and then I just do uh, element scroll into view, and then that element will be scrolled. So if it's 800 pixels down the page, the, the viewport will kind of focus that element uh, at the top of the page. So there's no animation, of course. There are plugins that do scrolling animation. In this case, it's just going straight to that particular element that you've targeted, kind of like when you click uh, local links or uh, in-page anchors that we call them. And it does take an optional align with top Boolean, uh, which you can see passed in there on line three. And this will tell it to align the bottom of the targeted element to the bottom of the scroll area. So it gets very specific if you want to do that specifically. And the default value, you can put in true or you can just leave it blank with no, no argument passed in. Uh, and that will just align the top of the element with the top of the scroll area, which is usually what you want. Okay, so <laughs> that, that's the end of the, uh, the features that I was going to look at in this presentation. I hope it wasn't uh, too overwhelming, a lot of code there in some cases. But again, there'll be some references at the end here uh, for you to fiddle around with if you're interested in looking at, in looking at those. So uh, what about browser support for all of these? Um, especially some of those more obscure ones that you haven't heard of. Well, believe it or not, all of the things that I discussed in this presentation are supported in IE9 and up, uh, which I think is really good, except the data set property and the computed pseudo element styles, which are uh, IE11 and up. And of course, they're, they're supported in all the other browsers as well. IE is always the, the problem. So yeah, so that's really good. And a lot of these, as I mentioned there, are supported in IE8 and earlier. So that's really good. So I, I don't necessarily consider myself a, a DOM expert. I'm researching these things all the time uh, and trying to write about them when I write articles. Um, but, you know, kind of, uh, if you want to know how to get on your way to becoming a DOM expert, uh, which we're, I think we're all wanting to do in our JavaScript careers, if that's what we're doing. Uh, first of all, get a good JavaScript reference. Uh, even though it does, of course, talk about the, the JavaScript core language, ECMAScript, uh, most JavaScript references will also talk, about, talk a lot about the DOM because, as mentioned, they're basically one and the same technology nowadays. Um, yeah, and uh, this is another one that I like by Nicholas Zakis, JavaScript for Web Developers. Uh, even though those books are a few years old, uh, they're still very handy. A lot of the methods that I mentioned are described in detail in those references. Uh, here's another good one called DOM Enlightenment. This is the only one I know of in book form that's specific for the DOM. And there's actually an online version as well that you can just read for free online. It's kind of the earlier draft, but it's still really good. You get pretty much get exactly what's in the 
uh, most of what's in the printed book, as far as I know. Uh, DomEnlightenment.com for that. Um, of course, the Mozilla Developer Network, which I think I'm sure many of us use. And don't be afraid of the specs. The specs, you can actually discover uh, new things as well. And uh, even in your DevTools console, you can uh, find this, this sort of thing uh, just by fiddling around uh, with uh, methods and properties. Um, I have a newsletter where I discuss these types of features as well uh, that you can subscribe to. And uh, yeah, just a little, couple of quick slides, a little bit about me. I'm a co-author of the book on the right, and as well as the book on the left. And I have a couple of copies of the one on the right. Uh, and I also have a, another book from SitePoint called CSS Master. Uh, if anyone's interested in grabbing a copy of those, uh, maybe we can do a, a trivia question. So who can, whoever can come up and tell me uh, the name of the pitcher that Jose Bautista hit his home run off of in game five of the ALDS. And I'll give you a copy of the books. And, I, and if possible, I'd like to also give one of the books to a, a, a girl, a female. <laughs> and so we can be <laughs> encouraging, you know, we always want to encourage uh, uh, women in tech, of course. So um, yeah, so if there's a, maybe if you're a bit of a beginner at HTML and CSS, uh, I'll give you a copy of one of those uh, if you can tell me the answer to that trivia question as well. <laughs> Um, so I'm Impressive Webs Online, impressivewebs.com, and there is the URL, uh, tinyurl.com slash domfitc, and you'll get all the references that I talked about in this presentation, as well as the slide deck. So uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, you can come and see me after, and uh, come up if you want one of those books. <laughs>